Well, good morning. It's good to see all your shiny faces this morning. Tell you what, our worship team, man, when a pastor gets up at a church on a Sunday morning at this church, they've already been in the presence of the Lord, and I think you have been too, amen? Yeah, that's our worship team. is phenomenal. Love these guys. Well, how many of you were here last week when uh, Dana and Mark Brown were here to share their testimony about Zoe Freedom Center? Yeah, a lot of you guys. Uh, Mark and Dana are good friends of ours, and uh, they started Zoe a couple years ago. God is moving mightily through them, and I just want to remind you to keep praying for these guys because uh, they're taking the next step of faith by getting a van to go into communities where addiction is, is real, uh, and they're going to share the gospel and to help people out of addiction, and so they're going right where the heart of it is. They're not waiting uh, for people to come to them. They are going to where the problems are. So I would just encourage you to keep praying for them, pray for the people that are... Uh, are going to be heading out in the vans uh, into these communities, and uh, I, we're just excited to be a partner with them and to be prayer warriors alongside them uh, in this journey that God has called them to. Well, this morning, uh, I'm going to ask, we don't ever say this, I know we don't ever say this, um, but I just, I'm just going to ask you a favor, uh, and there's a reason behind this, but can you just make sure your cell phones are either on silent or vibrate and, and not, not going to ring? Uh, this morning, we are looking at one of the names of God, and it is Jehovah Nisi, and, and uh, that title of God is, the Lord is my banner. And, and uh, so the, the whole theme of this morning is about spiritual warfare. You heard a little bit about that uh, through our worship. We're going to close with a song uh, that is just going to solidify our, our faith and our faithfulness uh, to the Lord and His faithfulness in our lives. And I just, I just believe that maybe somebody is here this morning and you're going through some spiritual warfare, and you are in that place. And I, you know, I don't, I just, distractions sometimes, I have done this for long enough. I know that the enemy likes to come and distract what God is doing in the middle of a church service. How many of you guys agree and, and know that too? It's true. And so uh, we just want to believe that the Lord is going to speak to our hearts, and if nothing else, that uh, going to give us the encouragement and the courage that we need to trust God for the next season that we are uh, going through some kind of spiritual warfare in. So this morning, I actually want to kind of start at the end, and then I'm going to come back to it at the end uh, as a way of sort of bringing this message together. Uh, first of all, uh, it's important to know that as a Christian, you never, ever have to fight your battles alone. There is never a time where a believer has to fight a battle alone. Sometimes we choose to fight the battles alone because we don't let God in, we don't let people in, but we never have to fight these battles alone. Secondly, I hope that those of you, especially as you've been in the Word and you've experienced what the Word has to say about spiritual warfare, that you'll understand that God is with us, He is for us, He can deliver us through anything we ever go through. There is nothing that you will face, have faced, will face, or are facing that God is not able to take you through it and give you the victory in it as well. I also want you to know that when you belong to Jesus and he has inscribed his name on your heart and he has written your name on the palm of your hand, his hand, it's because he knows you. I am so thankful that I serve a God that knows me and that knows what my need is. That's why this morning the first song that we sang was just so powerful to me, Speak the Name. Can we say that name together this morning? Jesus. Every demon has to flee at the mention of that name. Amen. So the story that we're looking at this morning takes place in Exodus chapter 17. And uh, those of you that have read this story before, it's the story of Moses, Aaron, and her going up on the mountaintop while uh, Joshua fights his battle against the Amalekites down in the valley in Rephidim. Um, and this, this is one of those passages of Scripture that can go lots of different ways. I'll incorporate some of them, uh, but I, I really, really want you to hear what the point of today's message is. Um, first of all, we can look at this as a story on Moses' leadership and prayer life, and, and there's so much that goes into the backstory behind what happens here. We don't have time for that, but 
Well, we can look at that. We can look at Joshua's obedience and faith to just trust that Moses is going to be interceding, that God's going to deliver them and walk with them through this battle. Uh, we'll see this in just a minute. They are not trained soldiers, so he's going into this first a big many battles without a, an untrained army. That's crazy to me uh, to think about that. We could even look at this passage of Scripture from the perspective of the Israelites who have just come out of 400 years of bondage in Egypt, and now they're having to face uh, an enemy that they've never had to face before. They're having to deal with something they've never had to deal with before, and, and this is going to be a first uh, for them. But this morning, folks, as I talk about some of those things, here's what I want you to hear this morning, and that is that we serve a God who has never lost a battle. He has never lost a battle. I've lost some battles, but he's never lost a battle. We are going to talk about a God who has proven over and over and over again that he is faithful and that has promised to fight for us. I love that Scripture gives us so many different names of God, and I know Pastor has already done a couple of those, and next week you'll come back and you'll hear more about the aspects and attributes of God based on names that were given him. But, uh, you know, the Bible calls him so many different things, strong tower, mighty God, redeemer, savior, deliverer. In terms of characteristics of him, he is perfect and holy and righteous and compassionate. And there's so much more. So who is this God that wants to lead us through battle? Let's take a look at Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 through 16. Scripture says, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses uh, told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held his hands up, uh, Israel prevailed, and whenever he lowered his hands, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun, and Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book. In other words, journal this. Some of you are journal, journal this. And recite it to the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. I want to look at the Amalekites for just a moment and the situation that the Israelites were in for just a moment because maybe you can relate to some of these things. Number one, with the Amalekites, we understand that they were a nomadic tribe. Uh, what that simply means to us is they didn't play by rules. They made the rules. They didn't worry about uh, what the art of war looks like. They didn't read any books by the other generals. They wrote the books on how to do war. They were not afraid to fight. They were trained fighters, and they did what they wanted to do. Se uh, se well, secondly, they were fighters. Number three, and this says it in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17 and 18, that they had no fear of God. Now, I think this is important for us to understand here for just a moment, folks. The enemy is not afraid of God, even though he knows where he's going. And he's not afraid of you unless you become a threat to him. And so you and I this morning are going to learn how do we become a threat to the enemy. How do we go into spiritual warfare fighting battles that we've never fought before? So what do we know about the Israelites at this moment of time? Number one, they had just spent 400 years in slavery, in bondage. These were not fighters. These were broken people. They, were, they, they had not trained how to fight battles. They didn't have the weapons. They, they didn't understand the art of without, like none of this, these things. They were coming out of 400 years of intense slavery. Secondly, this would be the first of several battles that they would have to fight before getting to the promised land. And I just want to say that to you. You know, I, I remember one of my pastors many, many years ago. Maybe you heard this as well through another pastor. But if uh, you haven't been in a battle, then you're either in a battle or you're going to go through a battle, right? We're all in one season or another of battles. And so depending on where you are, it's fine. But 
more than likely, we've all had to face one, more than one spiritual uh, battle. We also know that they had no military background or formalized military training. So what did they have? What did they have? I love this. They had the same thing that we have today, a commander-in-chief that knows us by name, who has promised to never leave us nor forsake us, and who stands beside us when we go into battle. They had the one who led them by a a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day, and we have Jesus. They had the God who delivered them from Pharaoh's hands, and we have a Savior with nail-pierced hands. Amen. I am so glad for the cross. I am so glad that Jesus got the victory. And we're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from a place of victory because Jesus has already gotten it. So this morning, we're going to look at this in four different parts. Number one, The enemy has no problem coming to you. In verse 8, it says, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. They approached the Israelites. The Israelites weren't out looking for a war. They weren't living in a way to try to pick a battle. They were just uh, pawns in in the game that the uh, Amalekites wanted to play. They seemed like a weak uh, uh, vessel, a, a weak sheep that the Amalekites wanted to go and take out. And I wonder how many of us can recognize when our adversary is attacking us. I've heard this in church, so what I'm about to share with you is not something that I've, is outside of church. Of course, I've heard it there, but I've heard it in church too from Christians saying, yeah, I'm just in a, I'm having a string of bad luck. No, you're not. You're going through spiritual warfare, folks. It's not about bad luck. I've also seen it, heard it, read it, watched it, people, Christians saying, well, you know, it's, just, it's all karma. What comes around goes around, yin and yang, that's good and the bad. Folks, no, it's not. That's not how God plays. That's not real life. That's new age garbage. We are in a battle against spiritual powers and principalities. That's what we're up against. And so there are times where we're going to go through a battle that we didn't pick, we didn't try to get into. It's just coming our way, and we've got to fight it. And there are times that we've caused ourselves to have to go into battle because of things that we've done. We know that. But we know that we have a Savior, a God, who loves us and will carry us through the battle. So this story is a reminder this morning that even though the Israelites had the manifest presence of God, what do I mean by that? This was still a season when the pillar of fire and the cloud traveled with them through the desert. They still had that, folks. They still had this manifest presence of God with them, and the Amalekites did not care. Well, let me step on some toes. Just because you own one of these and have it sitting on your coffee table, the enemy is not afraid of you. And just because you have a place in your house that you have designated at one time five years ago as your prayer closet, but hasn't seen your hiney in five years... The devil's not afraid of you. Or what about the notion that I've done my duty by giving God my one hour a week on Sunday mornings, but the 167 other hours of the week, I'm living for Steve. You see, folks, spiritual warfare is real. And though you can't see the enemy, he's real. And he wants to do battle in our lives. He wants to tear us apart. He wants to break families apart. He wants to destroy churches. He wants to take down pastors. By the way, pray for your pastor. The enemy is good at what he wants to do in our lives. And so this story this morning is just simply this reminder that he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for who he can devour. Who are the people he's going to look for first? Somebody who's kind of taken their eye off of Jesus. Well, I'll get to my Bible reading later. You know, prayer's important, but um, man, I, I got to get to work. I'm running late, so I'm just going to negate that. I'm going to leave that for later on. How many of you know later on never happens? He also comes after those of us that begin to question our faith, right? You've, maybe you've been praying about a situation for a long time, and God's not moving in that situation that you can tell. And so you kind of give up. And so the enemy, what does he do? He's going to start throwing some confusion at you. You guys know that God isn't real. 
come on, man, if he really loved you, he wouldn't let you go through this. See, that's how the enemy works. He starts attacking the mind. He starts attacking us in a place that we're the most uh, susceptible to. And he's also out there choosing those of us who fail to put on the full armor of God in the morning. Folks, I'm telling you, spiritual warfare is real. The enemy is real. And if we are not clothing ourselves with the armor of God before we get out of bed, we're in trouble. We got to be ready for any battle that comes our way. So number one, the enemy has no problem coming and knocking on your door. Number two, we need a plan before we need the plan. We need to have a plan in place before we need to utilize that plan. If you take a look at these verses right here in verse 9 and 10, let's look at them together. This is what Moses did. It says, Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with them, Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Now you need to understand something here. Moses wasn't winging it. Moses had spent a whole lot of time with God prior to this attack. Moses already had a plan of attack before the enemy came to attack. He was already in a posture where he was prepared to do something when something was necessary. Now, he wasn't there trying to scare everybody and make everybody else worried about it, but when Amalek came, he didn't say, guys, I don't know what we're going to do. No, he had a plan before he needed the plan. And so he implemented the plan. You know, every soldier has one of two responses, fight or flight, engage or retreat. Which one are we? Oftentimes, I think we forget, forget what a mighty God we serve. I think oftentimes we get into places of spiritual warfare, and rather than going to God and saying, God, I trust you, I'm leaning on you, we, we begin to blame God. We begin to accuse God. We begin to kind of pull away from God, whatever it looks like. And God is saying, I've got a plan in this, but you've got to trust me in this plan. You're going to have to go through this thing, but I'm going to be with you. I'm going to walk with you beside it. Do we have a plan before we need the plan? Are we prayed up? Are we read up? Do we have Scripture deep down on the inside of us? Moses did what he knew to do. He prayed. He got a plan. And then he executed the plan. He didn't run from the enemy. He didn't think about all the shortcomings of the Israelites. He didn't think about how they were unprepared, ill-equipped, untrained. He didn't think about the lack of weapons that he had and the, the, the weapons that they had. None of that crossed his mind. He said, this is what we're going to do. Why? He had a plan before he needed the plan. And just like us, we need to have a plan before we need the plan. That's why Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer. The very first line, I know you know it, what is it? Our Father, be thy name. That's all you need to know. Who's on our side? And holy is his name. And he will fight for us. He will fight for us. On every level, he will fight for us. That's why Jesus taught us to go to him first. Now, folks, I'm not saying that we, do, we begin to rehearse everything that we're going to go through in life. That'd be kind of silly. But are we prayed up? Are we read up? Are we prepared for when the enemy is going to attack? Are we, are we so close to God that we recognize the attack for what it is and know how to combat that? By the way, you don't combat it on social media. Come on. You combat it in the, in the prayer closet. You combat it when you call your errands and hers around you and say, I need help. Yeah. Folks, as you know, I'm a guy, and I only know what guys think and guys do, so I can't speak to you ladies about this, but here's what I'm going to say about us guys. We're not good about calling in errands and hers. We're not. We are more willing to go through a battle by ourselves than to call in people to come around us and help us. Well, if I tell my buddies that I'm struggling right now, <laughs> they're going to think I'm weak. Well, if I tell, you know, if I confess that I'm going through some anger issues on the inside, then 
I really can't tell anybody because then they're going to say, well, you're not so spiritual like I thought you once were. Now, ladies, maybe you're different. Maybe you got all kinds of friends around you. May, I don't know. I just know from a guy's perspective, we are not good at bringing people around us. And oftentimes, I think we also fail in the area of absorbing the Word of God in our hearts. Folks, I have a horrible memory, just so you know. Horrible memory. But I have read the Word of God so many times that when I go through a situation, when I'm facing a situation, the Holy Spirit brings about, reminds me of Scripture. It's not that I remember exactly what book of the Bible it is or what the passage is. I'm, I'm envious sometimes of people that can do that. But what I have found is when I'm going through a situation, the Holy Spirit brings back up the Word in my spirit and allows me the ability to walk through in power and faith. We need a plan before we need the plan. Number three, I want to look at this next one, the power of prevailing. In verses 11 through 13, it says, Whenever Moses held up his hands, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. Any of you ever got weary in spiritual warfare? We have. I have. I'm sure you have. So they took a stone and they put it under him, and he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And look what happens. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. This untrained, unskilled, unprepared army won this battle. Why? Because of Moses had a plan and he implemented the plan and the power of prevailing. I don't think that there's any mistake that this passage of Scripture reminds us that Moses brought that staff up on that mountaintop. You see, that staff represented the presence of God and the power of God. That staff was used when Moses was approaching Pharaoh to let my people go. It was used to strike the waters of the Red Sea until they parted. It was used to strike a rock for water to pour out to feed millions of people and all the animals that they had brought with them. So don't you think that when he got up on that mountaintop and he had that same staff in his hand, those Israelites, man, they were excited. They were stoked. They knew that God was with them. But I don't want you going out buying a staff today and striking rocks, so don't do that. It happened then. It's not going to happen today. But what is the significance of what he did? Oftentimes, throughout history in wars and battles, and some of you are way more schooled on this than I am, and, and I'm probably going to butcher this and you're going to come to me afterwards or uh, private mess me and message me and say, man, you really messed that one up, and I'm going to do my best with this, okay? Back in the day, and probably some today, a flag meant something. And when they went into battle, they had one person that was des designated to be the flag bearer. That person didn't carry any weapons. They didn't have a sword on their side. They didn't have a gun on their side. They didn't have arrows, spears, javelins on their side. They carried the flag. And while the battle is going on all around them, they are holding that flag high. And as long as that flag was held high, there was, there was courage instilled in the warriors, the, the army. As long as that flag was held high, they knew that, that they had God on their side in this case. But one of the things that I found that was interesting that really kind of plays so well into this message this morning is this. There was also always somebody designated to walk beside the flag bearer. Because if the flag bearer got hit, got taken out, that person's job was to make sure it never hit the ground. So they would grab the flag out of the flag bearer's hands and bring it up again. And that's what Moses is doing. Every time his hands are lifted up, Israel won. Every time his hands were lifted up and they, they saw him praying and they saw that staff that represented the presence and power of God 
what did they do? <laughs> Man, they had courage. They were willing to fight. They were willing to go in there and do it again. The flag is that place of rallying the troops together. It's a place of patriotism. It's a place of inspiration. It's a place that reminds us who we belong to. In this case, of course, I I chose the Christian flag because any church that you go to and you see this flag somewhere in the sanctuary, you know you're probably in a safe place or hopefully in a safe place with like-minded people. But you know in the New Testament, Jesus understood the relevance of the flag bearer. He understood the purpose of Moses on the hilltop when he said this in John 12, 32. Jesus saying about himself, he said, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. You know, the cross, that symbol of the cross is the most recognized religious symbol in the whole world. Even if somebody doesn't believe, they know what that cross represents. And for us, it's a rallying point. It's a reminder that God is for us. It's a, it's a rallying point for us to remember that God wants to be in the midst of our battles that we're facing together. And so these verses in 11 through 13 tell us several important things that are important for us. Number one, we need uh, um, errands and hers in our lives. We need people that we can text or call and say, man, I am struggling I am hurting today. It's amazing to me how we can come to a place like this and then walk out of here hurting, broken, and still in the middle of warfare and not let anybody else into it. Folks, if this isn't the safest place in the world for you to have people come around you and pray for you, I don't know what is. God has called us each to be errands and hers to one another. Secondly, we see here that Moses grew tired, right? He grew tired. I hate to break this news to you, but most spiritual battles aren't going to end quickly. Most of them. There are going to be occasions where you're going to wrestle with something for a long time. There's going to be some things that are going to come up against you, and you're just going to be saying, man, I'm tired. That's why we have the others around us. Giving up is not an option for the Christian. But I wonder how many Christians have given up on God because he didn't answer their prayer requests on their timeline. How many times have I, not you, me, given up on God? Also, I wonder how many of us have given up praying because God didn't answer our prayers the way that we wanted them answered. I remember many, many years ago, it's the biggest spiritual battle I've ever faced in my whole life. And I gave God something for two, over two years. And I believed that I was praying in the name of Jesus. I thought I was praying the will of Jesus. thought all these things. And guess what? He didn't answer my prayer. So then that led me to another place where I said, okay, if you're not going to answer my prayer that way, what's up? Well, folks, can I tell you that following that situation, God began to demonstrate to me why he didn't answer my prayer. And it's because his answer was way bigger than the the request I had. It was so much bigger, so much better. So even in my weakness of praying, even though I thought I was praying according to the will of God, God knew what I needed so much more than I did. Don't give up prematurely. And lastly, and I invite the worship team back up at this point, the Lord is my banner. How many of you know it's all about Jesus? Your situation, the circumstance you're walking through, it's all about Jesus. Now, we can give in to the temptations of the enemy to try to start pointing fingers and make it a a flesh and blood problem, but it's all about Jesus, and Jesus wants to fight the battles with us. And so in verses 15 and 16, it says here, and Moses, I'll just do 15, and Moses built an altar and called the name of it the Lord is my banner. God is the one that deserves the glory, not after he's brought us through while we're walking through. We need to lift high the name of Jesus, not at the end with a testimony, but in the beginning with a testimony. It is always, always about Jesus. 
So I said at the beginning that I was starting at the end, and I'm at the end, so I'm going back to the beginning. Number one, there isn't a battle that you've ever faced or will face that God isn't able to deliver you from and through. I want you to remember this morning that you serve a God that is not threatened by anything that you're going through, any temptation you've faced, any decision you've made. He's not threatened by that. We serve a God that has demonstrated time and time again in Scripture that when a person that belongs to Jesus is in the midst of a battle, that God can deliver us and wants to deliver us. He wants to bring us through. You know, I've often thought about my relationship with God as now as a father with my own son. I've got a great son, but I'll tell you, there are lots of times when he would love for me to do everything for him. Anybody else relate? Your kids want you to do everything for them. But if I don't let him walk through that journey by himself with me on the sidelines, praying for him and there for him, he's not going to learn. I think oftentimes we kind of view God that way. God, I don't really want to go through this, so you take it. I'm going to sit on the sidelines until we're through this, then I'll give you glory. No. How about we give God glory in the beginning? How about if we give God glory in the process? So this morning is about making God your banner today. About lifting high the name of Jesus over your situations and your circumstances. And so this morning as we go to our time of worship, we're going to open up the altars and you're here this morning and maybe you've been coming to church for a while and you're dealing with some old wounds that you haven't allowed to heal. Maybe you've become apathetic to the things of God and spiritual warfare. Maybe you've allowed things like anger, uh, bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness to come in and prevent you from being able to walk through this, this warfare, this battle that you're going through. And this morning God says, I'm here to set you free. I'm here to remind you that I've got this. You just need to trust me. So as we go into this time of worship, we're going to open up these altars. And, and I know that Pastor Brian and Nancy, myself, and others of you that are prayer warriors throughout this congregation are here for you. You say, you know what? I need to confess. I need an Aaron and a her to walk with me right now. We want to do that with you. So let's pray. We're going to ask you to stand. We're going to close in worship. We're going to invite you to come to the altars if you need to this morning. So Father, this morning we invite you into our circumstances. God, we want to lift up the, the name of Jesus before the things that we're walking through, the things that we carried in here this morning. So God, we invite you now into the answer to the battle. God, as Moses lifted his hands high and the Israelites got the victory, Lord, we come to a Savior who has been lifted up from the earth, one whom we can turn to this morning. So God, I pray that you would heal and deliver those who are walking through hardships right now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.